All right, folks. Good to have everybody here this morning. We're going to finish up today with this lesson on the uh, uh, three uh, the three ministries of Christ: prophet, priest, and king. And uh, we're going to finish that up today. If you have your Bibles, turn to the Book of Revelation with me, and uh, go to Revelation chapter number twenty. 21 rather Revelation chapter number 21 Father Lord give me wisdom now and then Heavenly Father give me the gift of teaching and then Father we pray that you give the folks ears to hear that they might receive your word not as the word of man but as it is the word of God in Jesus name Amen All right good to have all of you. We're going to get into the Bible today. We talked about the fact that as prophet the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. He gave himself for us as the prophet. He said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that stonest the prophets and killest them which are sent unto thee, how oft would I have gathered thee. The prophet therefore paid for your sins on the cross, not the priest. The priest nowhere in the Old Testament ever offered himself as a sacrifice. He always offered a sacrifice, but not himself. Therefore, as a prophet, the Lord died. As the priest, the Lord Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, high priest, interceding for us. His priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek, Hebrews chapter number 7. Melchizedek is a conjunction of two names, Melech, which is Hebrew for king, and Sedek, which is Hebrew for righteousness. So therefore, we have Melech, Sedek, or Melchizedek king of righteousness. So therefore, as a priest, he has a high exalted title because not only is he a priest, he's also a king. To understand his kingdom, therefore, you have to understand uh, what it relates to. He is prophet, he is priest, and now he is king. He will be coming as the king of kings and lord of lords. In Revelation chapter number 11, verse number 15, we move into that king, kingly reign where it says, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. That is coming. He's not reigning right now. The Lord Jesus Christ is still ministering as priest, as the high priest. And I want to call your attention to where we are in the book of Revelation, chapter number 21. If you'll notice the first part of the chapter, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. So therefore, if what follows in chapter 21 and 22, and I believe it follows chronologically, then we are in eternity, not the millennium. It's important to understand this, because the Lord Jesus does reign in the millennium, and He reigns over the nations in the millennium. But in chapter number 21 of the book of Revelation, we have a new heaven and a new earth. We're not in the millennium, we're in eternity. But if you'll notice in eternity, he is, he, is, uh, he is seated in a new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. Revelation 21, verse 16, 1,500 miles square. It's a perfect cube. He is reigning in Jerusalem, uh, the new Jerusalem over the earth in this new, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, new Jerusalem. In the millennium, he is not in the new Jerusalem, which comes down from God out of heaven. But in the millennium, he is seated in Jerusalem on this earth, and there he reigns over the earth. So in Revelation chapter number 21, as the high priest, he's reigning in the new Jerusalem over the earth. And I want you to see something else before we get into this. Look at Revelation chapter number 20 and verse 6. Revelation 20 verse 6. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. This is one of the things that makes me a premillennialist. On such the second death hath no power. What is the second death? The second death is hell. On the second death hath no power. But watch carefully. They shall be what? Priest of God and of Christ and shall reign with Him a thousand years. That's talking about us. That's talking about believers. That's talking about every single born again believer. This is why I firmly believe in the priesthood of believers. Every single born-again believer is a royal priest, according to the book of Second Peter. And that priesthood cannot be usurped. It can't be taken away from you. So we are priests 
under the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, and this priesthood extends into the future. It extends into the future of God's dealing with mankind. Now, some people are teaching that, uh, that you can have eternal life, that you can have eternal life by what you do, by your works, that you can earn it, that you can be good enough for it, or through church membership, or through baptism, or even through uh, eating a fruit from a tree. Now, in the book of Revelation, you have a tree that grows by the water. And that's in the millennium. And it's for the, the leaves are for the healing of the nations, the Bible says. And it's like the tree in the book of Genesis when the Lord said to Adam, spoke, really he was speaking, he was speaking uh, into the Trinity and said, put a guard that keeps the way to the tree of life, lest he eat of that fruit and live forever. Now he made a he gave a warning, and he, being a gracious God as he is, would not allow Adam in his fallen state because he'd already fallen. He would not allow him to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Now why? Well, number one, the simple answer is that even though he may have lived on or continued on from what he ate from that tree of life, he wouldn't have been alive. It would have been a constant death. Now that gets into an entirely different thing altogether from our study. But the bottom line is the Lord gives you not eternal life in the sense that uh, you're just going to live forever. What He gives you is the very life of God Himself. That's what you have as a believer. There's a difference between the two. Because I know of no greater curse that could be placed on you than for you to exist forever, yet be dying forever. Because without the life of God, you're not alive. You're not really alive. You're just existing. So in the millennium, in, the, in eternity, not the millennium, in eternity we find nations that are saved... But they're walking in the light of the New Jerusalem. That's quite a remarkable thing. Look at it carefully with me. Chapter number 21 of the book of Revelation and verse number 23. <clears throat> the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. There will be no artificial light, in plainer words. There will be no source of light apart from the, from the source of light himself. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now watch carefully in verse 24. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now, you're going to find a lot of argument. You're going to find a lot of controversy with the verses that I just read because most of the people are going to place this in the millennium where it's easy to understand. Because in the millennium, and in the millennium, the, the millennium is a, is, is a type in a lot of ways of eternity. Because a lot of, a lot of the things that happen in, in the millennium will move forward into eternity, into the eternal state. But they're not the same. We have nations that retain national identity in the beginning of eternity. Not forever in eternity, but in the beginning of eternity. Because this is what you have in Revelation chapters 21 and 22. You have laid out for you the beginning of eternity. Now, there can be no end to eternity, for it will last forever. But what the book of Revelation is doing is, lay, is showing you how that even in eternity, the church, that's what we are, the bride of Christ, have a special identity separate from anyone else that's ever lived. And our identity is that we are the New Jerusalem, the very abode of God Himself in eternity. 
the bride of Christ is what we're called. A lot of different names, as a matter of fact. But the last thing the Bible calls the church of God, and you'll find it in Revelation, the last, the last thing we are called is that we are called the New Jerusalem. We are the New Jerusalem. Now, the apostle says in the book of Galatians that Jerusalem, which is above and is free, is the mother of us all. Not earth. If you are of an earth, if you are of the earth, then you can claim Mother Earth as your mother. But I'm not of the earth. That which is in me did not originate from here. That which is in me originated from above. And Jerusalem, which is above, is free. The Bible says, is above and is free. And that was two thousand years ago. And that new Jerusalem has been growing for 2,000 years by every single born-again believer. And that is the mother of us all. Well, does bride of Christ and mother, is that synonymous? Would they be agreeable? It'd be awful hard for the father to be the mother, right? So in the spiritual sense, in the spiritual sense that we are related to the Lord Jesus Christ as the bride of Christ... Why would he have a bride? He has a bride because we will, be, we will be instrumental with him in bringing forth spiritual children into eternity. That's the purpose. Not physical children by any means of cohabitation, but spiritual children. This is why the kings of the earth in eternity walk in the light of the new Jerusalem. In other words, they'll be walking in the full revelation of the body of Christ as who we are in members in particular. There's an awful lot of people, folks, for the last uh, 4,000 years that man's been on this earth. An awful lot of people who uh, have had a relationship with God that make up the family of God. And the family of God is a big thing. Make no mistake about that. But he only has one bride. And his bride did not start in the time of Abraham. And his bride did not start in the time of Moses or David. His bride started 2,000 years ago. And he also called her his church. And he said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Therefore to the church which you are, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, you have been given a distinct, unique privilege that one day you will judge angels. And you are priest after the order of Melchizedek, which he is the high priest. And your priesthood is very clearly spelled out here in the book of Revelation, chapter number 20. It says that they shall be priests of God and of Christ. And that's us. And that's future. That has something to do with, the, with future. And remember what I told you the, per, the main purpose of a priest was, especially the high priest. It was to represent the people before God. That's the purpose. The ministry of the priest is for him to come in. This is why he had a breastplate and the epaulets on his shoulder was to come in before God and represent the people before God. He was therefore an intermediary. He was a go-between. And in this age of grace right now, the scripture says there's one God, one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. That's the only one. I know churches have put Mary in there and called her a mediatrix and so forth and so on. But they created that out of thin air. There's no Bible doctrine. There's no Bible authority for it whatsoever. Man wants to believe that. He can believe that. But the scripture won't bear it out. The Bible won't bear it out. The only one that can come between you and God the Father, and he comes between you and God the Father for you, is the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, when does he do that? He does that now. All right, he does that now, therefore, as a great high priest. So, therefore, is he fulfilling the function of a high priest? Yes, he represents men to God. He comes into the presence of the Father for you. And so, uh, the Scriptures teaches, therefore, that in the future, the priesthood of Christ will go into eternity. Now, what God intends to do, what's in the mind of God, is what he intends to do with all of mankind that are saved. The scripture teaches me that one day Christ will be, uh, that, uh, that uh, God will be all in all. The Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, will deliver up the kingdom to the Father. 
and uh, the, te- the Scripture teaches in so doing, therefore, that all of mankind eventually that are born again, that are saved, that are part of the body of Christ, and they all will be, make no mistake about it, there will be nobody living throughout eternity that's not born again. Because you must have the body of, a, of the Lord Jesus Christ, like His body, a resurrected, glorified body in order to live throughout eternity. Completed body, soul, and spirit. Now that's the priesthood. Now let me ask you this question. This is what I've given you. Here's a good bit of stuff. But from what I've said about the priesthood of Christ, does it not say to you that there's an awful lot going on here that's just not that simple? That God's relationship with mankind, He has summed it all up and brought it to its highest point in the church which is His body. That's you. In plainer words, nobody has ever lived on this earth that had any closer relationship with God than the church of God. Because you are accepted in the Beloved. But you've got to remember this. Unless you're born again, born of God, born with a divine nature, you're not in the church. You may belong to a physical church on this earth, but you're not in that church. The bride of Christ can be no closer, no more intimate, no greater loved than the bride of the Lord Jesus in church. Now the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. Revelation 11.15. Look at that with me please tonight. This morning. This afternoon. Tomorrow. We'll get it right in a minute. (laughs) Getting mixed up on time up here. All preachers do it. Amen. Revelation eleven fifteen. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So therefore he will never give up the kingdom once he takes it. And he will take it. Because the earth will not offer it up freely. They'll fight for it. As they are fighting now. And they are fighting, believe me. Every nation on this earth sees to its own affairs. And though in public they may appear to be friends, they're spying on each other. And uh, the reason they are is because they're concerned about their own national identity and national survival and national enrichment. Nations are doing that. But, of course, you're seeing one of the most profound things happen that's happened since the Great Depression. Things are happening now that didn't even happen in the Great Depression. And what you're seeing is the literal change of the monetary system the whole world. And uh, it may very well change in the, next, uh, in the next few months. You may see it. Uh, it's been called for by the Pope. It's been called for by the head of Russia. It's been called for by... Uh, the head of the European Union has been called for by the British Prime Minister. It's been called for by the heads of state of France and a number of other uh, heads of state that we need a world currency. And so this is, you get ready for that because if they ever do come out with a world currency, uh, you can believe that the nations are going to fight long and hard to get as much as they can for their currency to, to uh, you know, to, uh, uh, what do you call it when you translate it from one currency to another? Uh, exchange, when they exchange the currency, the, the, the exchange rate that's coming. And of course, you know if you're a Bible believer that that is an absolute necessity for the one world government. And you're right at it, folks. They're calling for it now every day. All right. So the kingdoms of this world, what kind of kingdoms do we have then, therefore? When the Bible talks about the kingdoms of this world, there's two kingdoms mentioned in the Bible. These two kingdoms are not the same. And a lot of folks say they are, but they're really not. One is the kingdom of heaven, the other the kingdom of God. Sometimes they run concurrently, sometimes they'll be in operation at the same time. But it doesn't necessarily mean they are the same. The kingdom of God can only be ruled by one qualified spiritually to reign over the kingdom of God. When Adam was made, placed on this earth, given dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, he was given dominion over the kingdom of God. But he was also given dominion over the kingdom of heaven. The reason he was because the kingdom of heaven had come down to the earth. And he was given that authority. 
He was given authority over the kingdom of heaven. So Adam had both. He wore two crowns. Kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. But when Adam sinned against God and died spiritually, he gave up immediately the crown to the kingdom of God. How could a dead man spiritually reign over the kingdom of God? That's an impossibility. But he also gave up the, the authority for the kingdom of heaven because Satan took that back. And by uh, deceit, Satan took the kingdoms of this world. And now he becomes the god of this world. And he is the god of this world. Even to this very day, Satan is called the god of this world. When, the, when Satan offered the kingdoms of the world to the Lord back in Matthew chapter number 4, that wasn't an idle boast. The Lord didn't rebuke him for an idle boast. He said, I can give you all the kingdoms. Showed him in a moment of time. The kingdoms of the earth. It was not the kingdom of God, but it was the kingdoms of, of the earth, which therefore had fallen under the sovereignty of the kingdom of heaven. He was ruling over it. He's ruling over this earth. And, when he, and, and he offered it to Christ. The Lord rejected it. He rejected Satan and he rejected his kingdom being offered to him in that fashion. But when the Lord Jesus came 2,000 years ago, he was uniquely qualified to reign over the kingdom of God because he was spiritually alive, had every authority for it. He presented himself to the Jewish people as their Jewish Messiah also. With that, he was offering them the kingdom of heaven at the same time because he was reigning over the kingdom of heaven that had been given to him. He was qualified for that. The Sermon on the Mount is the constitution of the kingdom of heaven. But they rejected their king. When they rejected their king, they rejected the kingdom of heaven, but then they set about to try to build it. He said, I am the chief cornerstone. You're building a building, but you've rejected me. You're not going to be able to build that building. You can't build a kingdom. So it falls back. It reverts back. To the God of this world, the principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. It's back under his power right now. The kingdom of heaven, therefore, is not a is, is not an earthly visible kingdom that is that is that is in that is that is in vogue or that is that is a reality, because this place is certainly no heaven. But it has fallen under the power of Satan until the Lord Jesus comes. And takes it away from him. Amen. And when he comes at the second advent, he will take the kingdoms of this world. Now, he won't take the kingdom of God because they don't have it. The Apostle Paul said, The kingdom of God cometh not by observation. It's not meat or drink. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. And every one of you that are born again are in that kingdom of God right now. Amen. You immediately were put into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is a place, therefore... Where Christ is king, he's Lord, he's master. And when he comes at the second advent, he will merge together the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And they'll stay right here on this earth throughout eternity. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, right here on this earth. And that new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven. That's the very bride of Christ himself. Now we've got the new Jerusalem, kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. We've got kingdoms showing up. When kingdoms means we have sovereign reigns, we have a sovereign over those kingdoms. If you'll notice, the Bible says in the book of Revelation chapter 19, I saw heaven open, behold a white horse, he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And then what does it say? And he was sitting on a white horse, and he was clothed with a vesture, down, and he... His name is called the Word of God. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen. See? King of kings, Lord of lords. So he takes the kingdoms. He takes them by force. He takes them as a man of war. He wins them, therefore, as the spoils of war. Having won them as the spoils of war, they become his by uh, de facto. The term de facto means you possess it. It can't be taken from you. It's yours. You might not have bought it legally. <laughs> you may not. Uh, but if nobody can take it away from you, it is de facto yours. So the kingdoms of the world become his because he takes them by force. And when he gets off of that white horse and puts his feet down on the Mount of Olives, it busts asunder right down the middle. And the water begins to bubble up from the Temple Mount. And flows down into the Dead Sea. And the seas healed. And the fish begin to jump out of the Dead Sea. And he walks into Jerusalem. And he sits down on a throne. It's the throne of David. 
David is the king that was anointed in Hebron. Then he was anointed in Jerusalem. He's the king, the only king that ever united Israel. The only king they ever had that ever united Israel was David. And the Lord Jesus Christ, where David was a type of him, will sit down in Jerusalem and he will unite all of the Jewish tribes together underneath him. They will unite under David, under the Lord Jesus, the greater David. They'll unite under him. And they will become the head of all the nations on this earth. It'll be Israel, be the Jew, and they'll become the head of the nations. And for a thousand years, he'll reign in Jerusalem over the nations with Israel, the Jew, being the head of the nations. And during that period of time, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. You will reign with him right here on this earth for a thousand years. You'll reign with him. He'll give, you, uh, he'll give you a place of authority to reign with him for a thousand years. And then at the end of a thousand years, the devil will be taken who was cast into the uh, bottomless pit. He'll be turned loose, come up, on the nation, come up on the earth and deceive the nations. Once again, Gog and Magog, they turn against God. That's when he puts down the final rebellion. And that's when he literally destroys the heavens and the earth. It's all gone. It vanishes away. It's gone. Just, just like that. And he creates a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And therefore, he is the king of glory throughout eternity. He's the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek throughout eternity. And he's the prophet that died on the cross so that you could be saved. With that memorial, with that mark in heaven, because he bears the scars throughout eternity of what he did for you when he went to the tree and died for you. That is as the king. He'll never be deposed. His kingdom, he says, there is no end. Amen. There's no end to it. And there's no end to the extent of it. There's no end to the size of it. There's no end to its growing. It will continue to grow throughout eternity into the future. If you'll take eternity and look at eternity past, eternity future, you'll see that there was a long time before there was ever a man. A long time. All right? Forever without a man. God made man, did everything that God was going to do with man in a 7,000-year period of time. 7,000 years. Therefore, if you look at the span of eternity and look at 7,000 years, you're looking at no more than a speck, a piece of sand on a seashore, one star, in the heavens. You're looking at a very small fraction of eternity. Yet during that period of time, he redeemed man and pulled him up from what he was made from the dust of the ground and put him at his very right hand. And then throughout eternity future, he has in store for mankind things that will blow your mind. For those that are born again, he has eternity unfold, unroll, and expand for those that are born again. Amen. That's what he's going to do for you. That's what he's going to do. It, eternity, you're talking about a whole new creation. Here's, your, here's where you make a big mistake. And that is that when you try to limit God to putting you in some place when you go into eternity, like you're going to set up housekeeping. Most folks have a have a kind of a, a twisted idea of heaven. They just they try to make it a glorified earth. The reason they do it because you think, well, heaven is, you know, this is the only life I've ever known is this one. So, therefore, heaven has got to be like this. But heaven's not. It's not. It's not a glorified earth. It's not. The Sadducees came to him one time and says, now, Master, in mockery, uh, this woman's had uh, how many husbands? Uh -huh. And the man she's and 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 this last one dies. All right, she's had seven husbands. Which one will have her in eternity? When they're going to set up housekeeping, in other words, <laughs> whose wife will she be? You see, the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in it. It's, everything had been spiritualized for them. And what did the Lord say back to her in reference to eternity? Do you remember? He said, you do err in not knowing the Scriptures, for in the resurrection they are as the angels. They don't what? They don't marry nor are given in marriage. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't know her as your wife or as your husband. Or the Bible says you'll know as you are known. 
you certainly will. In other words, you will know her as having been your wife and love her as your wife as you had loved her as your wife or as your husband. But as far as setting up housekeeping, the Mormons are the ones who teach that. The Mormons teach that you'll set up housekeeping in eternity and, uh, and have children in eternity and the children will populate the universe. The reason they teach that is because they had a, uh, Joseph Smith had a, when he began to get into what I'm talking about here this morning, you see all this I've been talking about, he got into that and he, he got to thinking, well, now this is what's going to happen here then. And he, and he began to develop a doctrine from that. And uh, his doctrine was that uh, God had had relations somewhere in the past with somebody, and that's where mankind came from. See, you get real perverted if you're not, if you're not careful. You get real perverted. And uh, probably every cult that exists has some basis and foundation in some kind of a perversion. They always, uh, they always get into perversion. And so he said in the resurrection, you'll be as the angels. Now, some folks take that to mean that in the resurrection or that angels are sexless. That's not true. Every time the word angel shows up in the Bible, it's in the masculine gender. And angels can appear as men, always had. They, they, they appeared as men. If it is of the different gender, you'll find it like in the book of Zechariah where you have, uh, you have these, you have female demons that come up out of a round uh, container and the lid's taken off of it and the lid was made out of lead and it's removed and when it does, here they come up out of this container in the land of Shinar and they've got wings and they're female demons. How many of you ever read that in the book of Zechariah? Some of you are looking at me, where in the world did you get that from? <laughs> Zechariah along about chapter, uh, is that where it is? Five. Zechariah five. The Bible is the most profound book that you ever read in your life. It will blow your mind, especially if you believe it. And I believe it. Now look at chapter 5 of Zechariah, verse number 5. The angel that talked with me went forth, said to me, Lift up now thine eyes, and see what is this that goeth forth. I said, What is it? He said, This is an ephah that goeth forth. He said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. Behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof, then lifted up mine eyes. Behold, there came out two women, and they, the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and heaven. And my goodness gracious, what he said is, this is wickedness, and it's in the land of Shinar. And of course, the time here in the book of Zechariah is referring to the millennium. It's talking about when the Lord Jesus Christ is sitting in Jerusalem and he's reigning. And he says, if the nations don't come and, uh, and uh, worship him and pay tribute to him, he talks about the plague that comes upon them. But this woman right here in the land of Shinar is directly connected with the rise of the Antichrist. The rise of the Antichrist because this is Babylon. And the Antichrist is going to come out of Babylon spiritually. And Babylon is, uh, it's here. It's here. Babylon is feeding the Antichrist at this very minute. Babylon. So anyway, to, uh, to uh, get back to where we were, where were we? That was over here in chapter number 20. 21, walking in the light, the kingdoms. Sometimes my mind goes flying off onto something I forget where I left from. We're talking about the kingdoms. The kingdoms in eternity, all right? <laughs> Revelation eleven fifteen. the kingdoms of the world, or this world, have become the kingdoms of our Lord and His Christ. Kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, will unite together under the Lord Jesus Christ. And the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God will be a sight to behold. And it will be that kingdom that there is no end. And you, as a born-again believer, will be over an unbelievable amount of authority of what you will have in that kingdom. This is a time for 2,000 years he's made up his bride. We're called uh, the jewels. We're called the uh, bride of Christ in the sense that uh, uh, he has relationship with us he has with none other. 
And the Bible says that he will present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He's preparing his bride. He's the only one that ever does that. Every other bride in all the Bible prepares herself. And then when she presents herself to the groom, he's shocked in awe at the beauty of the bride that presents herself to him. But not so the Lord. The Lord is presenting his, uh, preparing his bride to present her to himself without spot or wrinkle, a glorious church. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it. I am thank God this morning that I'm a member of that body of Christ. Amen. I am. And that body goes back for 2,000 years. We're on the tail end of the end. Amen. It's about finished. The body's about over. It's about done. There will not be a body in the millennium created. There will not be a body in eternity created. He will not create into the future another body of Christ. When the last one is born again into the body of Christ, it's finished. Amen. Then he'll have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen. 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 He'll have the marriage supper. Anybody got any questions? We've got about five minutes left. Seven years. Well, in the book of the second advent of the Lord Jesus comes in three stages. All right. Second advent is in three stages. The first is the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church. That's bang. He comes, gets us, we're gone. Second is the rapture of the tribulation saints. Revelation chapter number 11, the two witnesses, a type of that. Third is when he comes in chapter number 19 as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Amen. That's commonly referred to as the parousia. When he appears, he comes. They see him. He comes. The two that precede that, which makes up the total, are raptures when he catches the saints up to meet him. All right? That second coming, that second coming in Revelation chapter number 19 is spelled out in Ezekiel, Joel, other passages in the Old Testament, and it's literally a war. It's of battles, made up of battles, because wars are fought with battles. There's going to be more than one battle fought. And when the Lord Jesus comes, He comes from a northern route, and He also comes up the King's Highway from a southern route. And the final consummation of all of the battles that are fought of the Second Advent is Armageddon. That's when it's finished, at the Battle of Armageddon. See, now what you have here in Ezekiel 38 is when Gog comes down from the north. And the only, the only thing that what you have to do is identify Gog, who is Gog. All right, who is this? And go back and do some cross-referencing and, and check it out. And, and you'll find most people believe that it's a reference to Russia, in which I tend to agree too. Uh, Russia is a, uh, is a, is a maverick nation. They're, they, they're not going to become party to any group and then just yield up their sovereignty to that group. They will not become part of the Antichrist kingdom. They may use him, may give him lip service, but they will not. They will come down against Israel. We believe at the beginning of the, uh, somewhere along about the uh, uh, beginning of the tribulation period, somewhere in there, they'll come down against Israel. And when they do, God will destroy them on the mountains of Israel, and it'll take seven years to burn the weapons of war. That's that seven-year period, which, which means that it'll run for the seven years of the tribulation period because the tribulation period is not exactly seven years long. Not exactly, because the days will be cut short, according to the book of Daniel. It may be a little longer than seven years, but, the, but, but uh, Russia will be, their weapons will be burned on the mountains of Israel for seven years. In other words, a constant testimony and a witness going up. When God meets them. That's what, the, that's what Ezekiel's talking about there. Now, when you get on over chapter 41, 42, 43, and 44, you're talking about the millennium. You're not talking about uh, tribulation. Yeah. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh huh. It's the 70th week of Daniel. This is why we keep talking about seven years, seven years, seven years. This is why Ezekiel 38 fits right into that tribulation period. It's a seven-year period of time. <clears throat> and, uh, 
and, and uh, Daniel's 70th week is seven years. Seven years. 69 have been fulfilled. All right. Anybody else? We've covered quite a bit of stuff in here now for. Uh, yes, ma'am. For God to prove a point, he already knows everything. There wouldn't be God. But he proves his point to people. And the idea is that uh, he won't, because the Bible says the day is going to come, according to the book of Romans, when God is judged. They're going to judge God. People are going to say, were you fair? You know, were you fair with mankind? And, uh, for example, Abraham said that in the plains of Mamre when he said, shall not the judge of the old earth do right? And he was on the, on the verge of walking to Sodom and Gomorrah and destroying that place. And Abraham knew it. That's why he was interceding. The idea is that uh, God is doing this to prove a point. And in the book of Revelation, it says over and over again, neither repented they of their fornication, of their adulteries, this or that. See, neither did they repent. In plain words, he said, I brought this judgment. I did this to them, but it did not bring them to repentance. That's, that's it, to prove a point for his creatures. Even after a millennium, even after Christ reigning, even after Him visibly, physically being here on this earth, they still turn on Him, don't they? Yes, sir. Freud, though, is the, uh, uh, he's the textbook for liberalism because they believe that. They still believe that. They believe if they go in, change the environment, change circumstances, this and that, that they can, they can create a better man Yeah, and throw more money at it like they are the educational system. Throw more money at it and just keep throwing money at it. And kids today don't know half what they did 25, 30 years ago. It's, it's pitiful. They've got a high school degree now, a high school education, and, and it's pitiful. It's pitiful. Oh, and they keep throwing more money at it and throwing more money. But they've rejected God. All right. Anybody else before we close? We'll be done. We'll start a new, a new series next Sunday morning, Lord willing. And uh, I've had some couple of ideas going around and deal with. Yes, sir. No, that's not the, no, that's, a, that's Gog and Magog, if you look over there in Revelation, where he's turned loose at the end of a thousand years, and uh, that's in the uh, uh, end of a thousand years of where, where Christ reigns and Satan is bound. Armageddon, Armageddon completes the, the seven-year tribulation. It's a conjunction of two words, R in Hebrews, mountain of Megiddo, and I've been there. And, and the mountain of Megiddo, you can stand up and you can look down into a valley. Napoleon Bonaparte in the early 1800s looked at the same valley and he said, this is, the, this, is the, this is the most natural battlefield in the world. And so it is the mountain of Megiddo. That's what Armageddon means. And obviously it locates it. It puts it right up there at uh, Megiddo. Well, it's called the Plains of Esdralian. It's a long, long... You can put hundreds of thousands of men out there. It's that open, see? Uh, you, can put, you, can put, you can put an army over here of 50,000 and an army over here of 50,000, and they can meet each other right there in that such a huge area that the battle takes place. When the Lord comes, though, His, his uh, troops won't be on the earth. When he meets uh, the armies of Antichrist, they're coming from heaven. Amen. Amen. We're coming from heaven, not the earth.
All right. Well, we'll have a word of prayer and let you go. Amen. We'll pick up another study next week. Brother Yarbrough, will you dismiss us?